started. All right, welcome back. This is day two of the mix for Project Four yes. Rock Band. So, um, la yesterday, while it was snowing, I tracked some guitar overdubs and vocal overdub, um, and uh, included that in the folder here. So, under MUS 163 fall blah 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 guitar and Vox overdubs. You're going to want to download that. Um, it's going to be pretty quick. It's only three WAV files. Um, and that'll go wherever you download it to. So once you get that downloaded, go ahead and do that. It should take a few minutes. Um, and once that comes down, most likely it'll show up in your downloads. Um, but what I want you to do is open up that folder and we're going to drag and drop these into our audio files folder for our session. It's probably the best way to do it. What happens if you drag and drop files from some other folder, some other place into the session, it's going to source those files from this other weird folder somewhere on your hard drive. And if you delete that or you empty out your downloads, all of a sudden your stems are going to be gone. Because Pro Tools searches for the files, the audio files and folder locations, wherever you download it from or drop it into Pro Tools from. And you want that to be in the same spot, like all your audio files in your audio files folder, not floating around in different places. So that's why before I'm doing the session, I'm going to take these files. I got my... Um, rock band session here and here's my audio files for it this is all the audio files that are in the session thus far I'm gonna take these four bad boys and drop them into my audio files folder and they are now copied and found within this uh, this folder sweet so at this point I can just go ahead and open up my session so go ahead and reopen your Pro Tools session and uh, open up Pro Tools. It shouldn't matter. Just don't import those yet until they're in the audio files folder. And when you import them, you want to import them from that audio files folder so they're all all your stems are in the same spot does that make sense guys yeah and while we're doing that just so like if you were to in a, import these into your pro tool session your files will be sourced from the same audio files folder all your other you know stems and audio files are coming from all righty <clears throat> Nectar of the gods. If you get some error message like this, whatever, click OK. We know that we're missing some things. No big deal. All right. So just kind of looking at my session here. Um, looks like all my tracks are intact. In, in, <laughs> and um, just kind of a quick little recursor. Last class period, what we ended up doing was importing everything. Or we just opened up the session. We found the take that we wanted, which was take two. We put those audio files from the take two folder we downloaded into the audio files folder so that when we opened up the session, it was all there. Um, so we color coded the tracks. We summed the two kick tracks and the two snare tracks and sent those via a stereo bus into a auxiliary input stereo track that we called kick sum we did the same thing stereo auxiliary input track we routed via a bus out of the snare outputs into the input of this stereo auxiliary input um, we also created a drum sum a bass sum and a guitar sum track which was essentially just stereo auxiliary input tracks and started doing routing to route all of the drum sounds um, into the drum bus. 
So this is kind of a two-part thing. What you notice is we summed together the kick and the snare. All the other all the other drum tracks we didn't sum yet. Just the kick and the snare. So I created a another stereo bus to route from the drum tracks individually into the drum sum. So that's from the first video, but essentially the, what I was kind of getting at here is that instead of my kick front and kick back being routed into the drum sum, I had my kick bus set up to route the kicks into the kick bus, the kick sum, and then routed out of the kick sum into the drum bus. Meanwhile, all the other individual drum tracks are just being routed directly into the drum bus. So I have groups within groups. That's what's going on here. I'm grouping together sounds, like two kicks and two snares. Uh, and then I'm routing that along with all the other individual drum tracks into a, a drum sum. So I'm grouping individual drums together, pairs, and then I'm grouping everything as a whole into the drum sum. So I can process a pair of kick drums, an individual kick drum sound, or I can process the entire drum kit, or an individual sounds. So the idea is you can process EQ, compress, whatever you want to do, to individual tracks as well as groups of tracks. And then you can control the whole drum set with one fader via the fader on the drum sum. So that's, that's the reason we group and route like that. Okay, so that's as far as we really got. We might have started to process some of the kick drum sounds and whatnot. Um, we'll, we'll continue with that today. So before we continue and start mixing the drums, we want to import and fly in these overdubs for the guitar and the voice. I have four, I think there was three, three guitar tracks and one vocal track. So um, I have my two guitar tracks from the scratch take and then I have this uh, guitar, this scratch vocal track. Rather than deleting these or um, s dropping my audio on top of these tracks, I'm, I'm going to sh hide and make inactive these three scratch tracks. So first of all, select the guitar tracks and the Vox scratch track. You got them select, selected here. Then you're gonna right click on the nameplate and go to hide and make inactive. Those tracks disappear from view. They're not gone for good. They're up here in your track list on your um, edit window here. And they're in your track list right here. They're just hidden. You can always bring them back by selecting them and clicking this little dot. Basically what that'll do is that'll bring the track back even though it's inactive, it'll bring it back. And you can see it's here, but it's inactive. I'd have to click on it and make active that track if I wanted to bring it back to life. But essentially, I can just like get it out of the system without making it totally disappear. Just get it out of my way. And if I need it, I can recall it later. So I've got four tracks I need to create. Three guitar tracks and one vocal track. They're all mono, I believe. They're all mono tracks. So let's create four new tracks. They're going to be going to the right of my bass track here. So I'm going to select my bass track so that when I create these new th three tracks, it's going to be placed to the right of my bass track and stay, and stay in order. You know, I don't have guitars sprinkled out throughout my mix somewhere random. So select the bass track, um, Command Shift N to create a new track. I'm creating four mono audio tracks. So I just hit the number four and it's already mono audio tracks. I hit enter and boom, there's my four new tracks. Okay, to the right of my bass track. Now I can double click on the first nameplate and start naming these tracks. So first is going to be guitar one. The next one is guitar two. The third one is guitar solo. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Guitar 3 Solo because it's labeled and named the stem. The audio file is na named Guitar 3, but I want, it to I want to understand that it's a solo, so I put solo in there as well. 
And then the next one is vocals, or vox for short. OK, cool. Now, everybody created these, these tracks here, all right? Everybody renamed them? We're doing good? OK. So far, so good. OK, so I'm going to go to my, um, my edit view. Command e equals there to flip over to my other window here. And um, I want to bring up that window, that file browser window or the finder window so I can drag and drop my audio files in here individually. So check this out. Command tab brings up this little selector where you can choose to open another window. So right now I have all these applications or windows open currently. I'm going to go to my finder and boom, up pops my finder where I can look inside of my audio files and find the most recently added guitar one, two, three, as well as my vocal take, wherever that is. Okay, so check this out. When you're in the file finder, file browser, whatever you call this thing, it's a finder in Mac world, but um, I can organize these columns of information by clicking on the column heading. So if I want to organize things by the date it was modified, which in this situation helps me you know, separate the different stems that I've imported and created at different times, I'm going to click on the date modified section. And now I have this nice orderly list that's, that kind of organizes and filters out or sorts the stuff. So I see these are the, the, the most recent takes right here. The new stems are guitar one, two, and three, and the Vox 23. So I'm going to take guitar one. I'm literally going to just drag it over here onto the guitar one track. I'm going to scooch it over so it's lined up and pressed against the left side of my, my window so that it's hopefully lined up with the rest of the, um, the audio and it syncs up. I'm going to go command tab again, which brings up my browser window again. I'm going to grab Guitar 2, drag that over here, oops, place it in the right track, Guitar 2, Guitar 2, Command Tab, Guitar 3, or the solo, goes there, scooch it over, Command Tab, and the vocal track. Scooch it over. And hopefully all this lines up when I hit play. used amp modeling software and it didn't bounce the amp modeled oh. okay it's okay it's okay we'll keep going I need to go home and run these inputs I need this is a DI guitar which ran through amp modeling software that made it sound like a JCM 800 Marshall amp but I failed to bounce it with the effect on it. So now it's just raw DI. Whatever, no big deal. I'll circle back around and bring the stems out that are proper. Uh, my bad. Um, we're not probably even going to get to the guitars today anyway. If we do, um, we'll move on to the voice. So anyway, um, yeah, so basically how I recorded this, since we're already talking about it, I have um, amp modeling software, so I can just plug my guitar directly into my interface and run it through any amp I desire and pedals and combinations and things that sound exactly like if I set up a loud amp in the other room like that guy's doing and made a bunch of noise and plugged a bunch of cables in and took half my day to do that. I'd rather just plug directly in, drop, bring up a plugin that has a JCM 800 and literally plug and play and record my tracks in like 15 minutes. That's what I did. Um, it's way more efficient and, and honestly no one's gonna be able to tell that you didn't actually record a JCM 800 amp because it sounds Close as I could get, you know, as far as, you know, recording that real amplifier. 
um, it's pretty darn close. So anyway, that's how that worked. Um, you just got to remember to balance it with the effect on it or it doesn't work. So let's go back and start doing some of our routing. So we've got the drums routed, um, guitars and voice. First of all, they're the generic blues, which I don't like. I want to make these colors um, to reflect the instruments. So I always make my guitars green because I have a green guitar and that's my favorite color. So guitars are going green. And um, I'm going to do one shade of green for the two rhythm guitars and then another shade of green for the lead guitar, the solo guitar. So it's a little bit different and it, I can tell it apart. So I'm going to go with like a little different shade of green there. Kind of a darker, I don't know, whatever, just another shade of green so I can tell them apart. And then my voice, I always make voice pink. I don't know why, but that's what I always do to make it pop out. There's the voice track. It's pink. Sweet. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do a couple more routing things. Earlier, last session, we created a stereo auxiliary input for the drum sum the bass sum, and the guitar sum. They're just sitting here, not routed to anything yet because I was going to use them at a later point today. So I'm going to take my three guitar tracks, I'm going to select these three guitar tracks, and I'm going to route them into my guitar sum. So I have one fader that controls all my guitars. All right, so with those three tracks selected, I'm going to hold down Option and Shift. I'm going to go up to the output of one of my guitar tracks and choose the next stereo bus which happens to be bus 7 and 8 on my machine doesn't matter what it is as long as it's a stereo bus the, ne the next one available any of number will work just fine okay cool so now three of my guitar tracks have an output set to stereo bus 7 8 I'm gonna rename that so I don't get confused later I'm gonna call that bus guitar bus by cl right clicking on it and renaming it guitar bus boom now I'm gonna set the the guitar bus is routing the output of my guitar channels to another location where am I routing my guitar tracks to the guitar sum yeah so how am I gonna do that What's my next step? Totally. Yeah, or guitar bus if you renamed it already. So, yeah, I'm going to go to my guitar sum where this is this signal's headed towards and I'm going to go to the input and I'm going to choose the guitar bus as the input. Boom, all good there. <clears throat> okay. Um sweet. Um I also have this bass DI that I'll probably duplicate this bass track and maybe do some things with it, maybe do some amp modeling or just you know EQ my bass um, with different EQ setups to emphasize different parts of the bass. I'll show you later, but initially let's just route the output of the bass DI into the bass sum. So that's going to follow the same process. I go to the output of my bass DI track, I choose the next available stereo bus which is bus 9 and 10. I'm going to rename that so I don't get confused by right clicking and renaming it base bus. <clears throat> then I'm going to connect that with the input of my base sum track. Boom. All right, I'm going to do a couple other things now. I like to have a master fader on my sessions so I can kind of control the overall volume of my mix or just have one meter that reads the entire mix. <clears throat> so I'm going to do that next. I'm going to create a new track. So Command Shift N. It's going to be a stereo track. So I'll hold down Command and hit the right arrow to switch from mono to stereo. And it's going to be a master fader track. So I'm going to hold down command again and hit the down arrow until I toggle to master fader. So I'm creating one master fader. Oh, so you see where it placed it? To the right of my previous selected track. 
So what I should have done is probably selected this track and created it so it popped it on over there. No big deal. I'll just scoochie boochie on over to the right. Yep, stereo, master fader. You want to be stereo there coming out of your um, left and right outputs of your interface. Okay, so there's another theory that a lot of engineers have, um, and the ones that taught me how to do all this stuff, um, I follow that pattern. Um, well, what's up? Uh, don't you, like, wouldn't you need solo protect or anything? You don't need to solo protect the master fader because there's no solo button on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but any other auxiliary input track that you create for routing, you're going to want to solo safe it by hitting command and clicking on the S button so it's grayed out. Yep. Any auxiliary input you're using for effects routing or sums, always solo save it. So the theory is that um, the mix sounds better if you, if you don't have a large amount of tracks hitting the master fader all at the same time. So the idea is, I guess my brain, my lizard brain, understands this as the best way to organize audio is to like treat it like what happens in the natural environment. Say you have like a whole mountain range. It's a watershed. It rains, it snows, whatever. There's snow on, all, on tops of the mountains. That snow melts. It trickles down in little creeks and little drainage areas. And it, and it, works, away, it works its way down the mountain into bigger streams. It comes together in these streams. All these streams kind of converge down into a river. That river, you know, all the, all the streams join and it's a big river of water. That river flows out into the ocean of whatever. So everything starts and it's all little tiny individual streams and it all kind of audio just kind of comes together into bigger groups and bigger groups and finally comes out into the main left and right outputs of your, your world, your headphones, your monitors, whatever. So that's kind of how the audio works. I have all these little trickles, these individual streams of sound. They all get kind of slowly grouped together and then they exit. So that's the idea for routing. You take groups of instruments you group them together, and then you take all the instruments, and you send them to a sub-mix, which is nothing more than another sum track, but a sum track where you send all the groups of instruments to another one fader. So I do this. It's just a habit. Some people say it sounds better because there's less simultaneous sounds hitting your master fader at the same time. Maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't. I don't know. A and B it. Check it out. But we'll do it today. So we're going to create one more auxiliary input, one more stereo auxiliary input. So command shift N, it's going to be stereo, it's going to be auxiliary input, and you're going to create it, and you're going to call it the sub mix. And a lot of times I'll make it red. I'll change the color of the submix to be red because that's kind of what my master fader is, is a darker red. So I'm going to use like a lighter reddish color just so it, it's kind of similar in function and similar in color. <clears throat> Sweet. All right, cool. So I need to solo safe that submix with a command click on the S. It's solo safed. Now I need to route all the audio into it. So let's work our way backwards. I know that I need a stereo auxiliary, or I need, I need a stereo bus to feed into my submix, because it's basically collecting all the individual sum tracks before it goes to the master fader. So I'm going to go to the input of my submix track. I'm going to choose the next available stereo bus which on my machine is 1112. Now we're going to rename this Mix Bus. All right. So all of my sum tracks as well as my voice because my voice is just independent right now. There's no sum track for my voice there's only one vocal track so I don't didn't really need to create a sum for it no purpose I'm gonna take I'm gonna by holding down command and clicking on my guitar sum my bass sum my drum sum and my vox track I'm 
I'm going to select those four faders right there, those four tracks. And I'm going to hold down Option and Shift and go to the outputs of one of these tracks and set it to the mix bus. What's that? Yep, stereo mix bus. It should be stereo. And if I hit play, I should see signal out of these two faders. Okay, cool. I got signal. I can hear audio. I see signal coming through my submix and my master, which means I did my routing correctly. So let's do a little quick recap of this whole setup. Um, Where's my skinny faders? Narrow mix. There we go. So just so we can all see this on the same screen here. Woo, nope. Um, here's the routing. So I have my entire collection of drum instruments, which is all these blues. The first thing I did is I grouped together the kicks and the snares and routed them to an auxiliary input track functioning as a sum track okay then i routed these two sums which speak for these two pairs and then all these other individual drum tracks i routed those into the drum sum where i collect all of the drums and i can control the drums as a whole with one fader drums up drums down drums compressed drums eq whatever i can compress and do stuff to the entire drum kit all right, I did the same thing with the bass, just one bass track, but we'll probably duplicate it. I also did the same thing with the three guitar tracks, guitar sum, bass sum, and then I have a lonely voice track, which is just by itself, so I didn't really need to duplicate it. I just left it there. All right, so those groups of instruments have been um, routed to their sums. Then the sum tracks were all routed into the submix, which then feeds out of the master fader and out of your stereo headphones or monitors. So that's the routing. Things sort of slowly come together. Instruments are grouped within groups of instruments, and then groups of instruments are grouped, and then those are routed all to the submix and then out through the master fader. So does that make sense? The routing stuff? Awesome. All right, I'm going to go back into a normal mix view. If you guys ever want to change your mix window to be narrow like that, you can go to view and you can change to a narrow mix view which makes your mixer your channel strips much thinner so if you have like a massive collection of you know faders it's a little bit easier to kind of have them all on one screen all right so let's go back to processing audio the idea is we go through all of the drum sounds individually we check them out we see what they sound like we do some EQ to kind of filter out other sounds or to improve the sonic tam timbre, tone color of that sound. We put some compression on it to control the dynamic range, maybe give it some more pop and accent the, the articulation and make it like a little bit more present because compressors we know can add attack. They can also add sustain to a sound and they can also manage the volume. We can make it a little bit louder so it's easier to balance, or we can manage um, and, and sort of lessen the fluctuation. You know, a compressor, it limits the, the, the dynamic range of a sound, so it's easier to balance if your kick drum doesn't fluctuate in volume dramatically. You put a compressor on it, and it's kind of like now it's more of a level sound. Same thing with any other sound. Compress it. You um, can make it pop and slap a little bit better, more articulation. You can also keep it at a even dynamic volume so that it's easier to balance with the other instruments. So I usually compress pretty much everything just because it adds a little bit of something to everything and some things I compress a lot, some things I compress just a little bit, but um, yep, I will, I'll be doing that just because it's force of habit. So uh, I think we did kick drums. We started with the kick front, which was the kick on the front of the drum head. We put a little EQ on that to uh, a low pass filter, it looks like. 
around 4K. And we did that to filter out some of the snare and cymbals that bled into the kick drum. We also um, have a kick beater, which picked up a lot of snare. It's a small diaphragm condenser. Probably won't ever do that again because it's picking up way too much of the snare and the other sounds. Um, it did really great at getting the beater, but it also picked up other stuff. So note to self, small diaphragm condenser on a beater side of a kick drum, not so great. Probably SM57 would be a better choice. That's what we did today in the session, and it sounds way better. Still has the punch and the pop of a beater, but doesn't pick up every sound in the room. So um, that's what's up with that. Um, put a little compression on the low bass kick. Um, anybody like feel like they want more bass out of that kick drum? Anybody all about the bass? How, how can we make bass happen? How can we like add bass to a sound? Yeah, we could filter it more. But we risk using some, losing some of the definition of that sound. We lose, if we keep filtering this away, we, we lose some of the more mid-range sounds of that, that, that kick drum. How about this? What if we duplicated this kick track? So now we have two of them. In the second, in the in the other one, we filter even more of the highs out, and we use really really hard compression to just really, you know, bring up the low subby parts of that and compress it and mix it in in parallel with the other two sounds. Let's try that. So um, I'm going to right click on the kick front. I'm going to choose uh, Duplicate down at the bottom. And it's going to do this. And yeah, OK, fine. Um, and I just have a duplicate now of that track. It's already got a compressor on it. It's basically just a copy of that previous track. That worked for everybody? Right click Duplicate on the kick front. I'm going to unsolo the earlier kick front. And I'm going to rename this kick front duplicate kick sub. So I get, um, I know that this is focusing on the sub low frequencies of the kick drum. Now I'm going to go ahead and play the, the audio of that one track. And I'm going to grab my high pass or my low pass filter here and roll off even more. maybe boost some of that subby 100 hertz stuff. OK. Um, another thing I might do after this is check out my compression and see what's going on with my compressor. If I change my attack time to be pretty, not super fast, but kind of fast. So the attack time on this plugin is weird. All the way to the right is the quickest attack and the quickest release, even though the number is higher. Makes no sense with the dials, but that's faster attack. So the attack is, I've dialed it back a little bit, and I've turned the release time to be as quick as it is, as, as, as it can go. And watching my needle, it pops back down pretty quick. I want it to recoil. I want the compressor to recoil. I might also try different ratios. Ooh, listen to that. You hear that? When I went to the 20 ratio, I hear a lot more bright attack to that kick. That was interesting. Okay, so that's what I did with that compressor. Now check this out. I'm gonna go ahead and solo all three of my kick drum tracks. And I'm gonna turn the faders all the way down. One of my kick drums tracks is a beater. One of it is the kind of the the overall front sound of the drum head, and the other one is just focusing on sub bass. 
So I'm going to bring up my middle of the road kick, which is just the front of the kick drum. Okay. Now I'm going to bring in some beater. And then I'm going to bring in some sub. Hear how fat my, my kick drum got? Super fat. kind of messing with the um, low pass filter on that kick beater I might apply a, a slight low pass filter just to kind of tap down some of the snare bleed I can't do too much but I lose my beater okay cool so between these three faders I can mix my kick drum with three different tonal aspects to it. Sub, mid-range, just raw mic on the drum head, and then beater. And I can make my kick kind of sound whatever I want it to sound like. I can control those three aspects by compartmentalizing the sound. I duplicated two of the, one of the tracks, so I have two of them. One's for EQ'd high, one is EQ'd low. Then I have my beater, which brings out the pop or the slap of the, of the beater sound. So I can I can like kind of mix that to taste, and it's all sent to my kick sub. I'm sorry, my kick sum track, which I could also compress again, just to tighten those sounds up. See if it sounds good or not. I'm not, not, I'm not sure about that. I might not use that compressor. So another thing you do when you're trying to decide on, do I like this compressor? Do I like this EQ? I don't know. I can't tell because I've been listening to it too long. The way that you test and check yourself is you A and B a plug-in. You turn it off, you turn it on, you see if it sounds better or worse. So what I would do here is listen very critically at my kick drum, get my, my compressor kicking the way it should be, uh, light or hard, depending on what I'm going for, and turn it off and on and see if I like it or not. Okay, um, I don't know. I might leave that on. The thing is, the compressor brings out the kick, the snare drum a lot, which I don't like. I don't want the snare kicking really hard in my in my my kick drum sound. But I'm kind of my hands are tied because I use that stupid mic. All right, cool. Let's move on. Um, snare, snare time. I bet you the snare sounds really good. I think so. We didn't screw around and do something silly like put a small diaphragm condenser on it. So let's check out our snares. Let's start with the snare top, which is the general way you, you mic a snare from the top and see what it sounds like. What do you guys notice about the snare? A lot of reverb. A lot of ringing, right? Um, how can I control ringing or the, the decay of a sound? Of what? Uh, 
Yeah, I mean, you're barking up the right tree, but, <laughs> but no tree on falls. what? <laughs> like, what tree? Are you barking up a tree or like a, a vine or a building? What would you change the attack and release times on? Yeah, you could use a compressor to kind of shape that sound a little bit. Okay. Um, you could also use a gate to try to, you know, if the gate kicks on and off when the snare hits, you can control the gate's release, which will kind of tighten up that snare sound a bit. If you don't want that ding, ding, after every single snare hit, you could use a gate to tighten up that sound. A compressor might give you the same effect too. Um, let's try the gate. You guys want to try that first, see if we can make that gate sound good? Why not? So I'm going to throw a gate from the dynamics category on that snare top. And what I'm looking for is I want the, the gate to open up right away. I don't want it to be slow because I want the snare to sound like a snare, not lose its attack. So my attack time needs to be like as low as it can go. Um, now my release time is going to be what changes the sustaining release of the sound envelope. So now that I've got this dialed in, I'm going to make sure my threshold is working proper properly. Okay, that seemed to do it. I messed with the um, the ratio. I turned the ratio up pretty pretty high so that it, it was a complete cut off of the sound. It's completely off or completely on. The attack is really short. And then I changed the threshold a little bit. And then I changed the release time so I can shape the envelope. And this is what I'm getting. Okay, in the rest of the mix, let's see what it sounds like. Ah, so loud. So it did kind of tighten up the snare sound a bit. My snare's a little bit tighter. It doesn't go bang. So that's kind of a, yeah, that's one solution to snare ring with the overtones that kind of carry on forever. I just used a gate to kind of trim off the end of the, uh, the sound envelope. You might use it, you might not, I don't know. Um, it seems to be working okay for now, so I'm gonna leave it there. Um, now I'm gonna go ahead and go into my usual signal chain of EQ and compression with that snare. Maybe just EQ, honestly. I might compress the snare, the two sounds as a group this time. I, it might be redundant to, or just might be over, over mixing to like compress the individual snares and then compress the snares as, as a group. I'd rather just EQ the snares individually and then compress the snares as a group. I'm going to do that. So um, I'm going to throw an EQ on, I guess, after the gate. Um, and then understanding that this snare is a, the snare top is kind of a full frequency range type of situation. Um, the only bleed I'm really worried about, well, let's see if there's any bleed at all. Well, now there's no bleed <laughs> because of that gate, right? Um, okay, here's another idea. What if I put the EQ before the gate and I filtered out some of the kick and some of the cymbal sounds so that didn't trigger the, the gate? Because one of the issues with the gate setting was like the kick drum is pretty loud and it's right next to it. So it could trigger the gate on accident if the kick drum hits really loud. You see what I'm saying? Like dynamically, two sounds are bunching into that microphone. We looked at it. You know, got got really close to our snares. We can see that um, 
there's other notes in between sometimes. They're not very loud, but snare, top and bottom. Um, there's no right and wrong way to do this. There's only things that sound good and tools that you understand how to use or you don't understand how to use. So, you know, this might not be what I would do, but um, kind of going through these tools and learning how to use them, getting some experience with them. So let's play around a little bit. So I'm going to put my gate after my EQ because I, I thought that over and I kind of like the idea of filtering out the non-snare sounds before I gate the whole thing. So I'm going to use command click on the gate to deactivate the plugin. See how this plugin's blue and this plugin's blue? If you click with command held down, it bypasses and, and disengages and turns off the plugin essentially. So I turned off my gate and I'm just going to listen to my my snare top and EQ it to improve the sound a little bit, get rid of some of the stuff that shouldn't be in there. I've got some kick in it, which is no big deal. I'm going to use a high pass filter here to get rid of some of the kick in that snare. I don't want to affect my snare sound. So what I'm listening for when I move this filter back and forth, forth is I'm listening to the snare and when it starts to affect the snare's tone. You're going to notice the kick drum slowly disappears as you roll off the low frequencies, but you don't want to affect the snare's tone. Not so much. My goal is to remove kick, not remove the low parts of the snare. I like the low parts of the snare. I'm going to keep it there. See how the kick drum kind of disappears and my snare still is intact? Now I'm starting to affect my snare. So probably around uh, 250 hertz is as high as you want to go with that high pass filter. I might also maybe mess around a little bit with a low pass filter, see if I can get some cymbals out of there. Okay, not bad. Um, 500 hertz is a boxy quality of a sound. Um, it's usually not attractive, not a good sound. So I'm going to try dipping out with a notch filter some of 500 hertz. So I grab this uh, mid-frequency filter here. I set it on 500. And I'm going to use a very narrow cue just to tap down the 500 hertz a little bit and see if that, I don't know, makes my snare a little bit more crispy and less muddy and mid-rangey. Okay. Yeah. I could also maybe accent some of the upper frequencies of the snare. If I find parts of it that I do like, I could fish around and find something that I like and maybe boost that a touch in the same direction. So say if I liked like, you know, I liked 4K because it had some nice pop to it, I might find some of that. Oh, cool. I found some really cool slappy sounds around 2.8K. It kind of like reminded me of the stick slapping the drum head, like kind of the, the source of the pop and, you know, snap, you know, of the snare, uh, of the drum stick hitting the surface of the snare drum head. You kind of hear what I'm saying? Yeah, around about, yeah, what did I say, about 2.8, 2.8 kilohertz. So I boosted that a little bit with a tiny little narrow cue, boosted it like, you know, um, 3 dB or something like that. So this is kind of how you use these types of filters. You fish around, you find something you like, and you give it a little tap, a little narrow cue, 
So it's like just punching out that one frequency. Don't go crazy. You don't need 10 dB of you know, gain on this one band. You probably need three max. And uh, I did the same thing with the muddy sort of boxy mid-range of 500, which, which I think sounds like crap. So I'm going to roll that way down like I did, about negative 6 dB. And now my snare is a little bit more crispy and punchy and just clean. Um, I got rid of the stuff I don't like. I boosted some of the stuff I liked. Got rid of the other drums that ring into it a bit. And uh, cool, I'm happy with that. All right, sweet. So I might engage my, my gate again and see what's up. If I like it or not, I can leave it or take it. doesn't matter. Okay, um, I think it sounds okay. I'm going to move on. I'll come back to that, maybe reassess later. Let's go to the snare bottom. So the snare bottom is your source of what quality of the snare? What are you going to hear with the snare bottom mic? The rattle, the, rattle, the sizzle, the, the metal metallic wire looking metal wire that's pressed against the bottom of the drum head that causes the shh kind of the sizzle of a drum, of a snare drum, the snare as it's called. So um, I know that's what I'm getting, what I'm searching for. I know that's what that drum sounds like. I know that it's also going to get bleed from other instruments really close by, like what? Yeah, the kick drum's right next to the snare, and it's like on the bottom too. So I know I'm probably going to want to use a high-pass filter to get some of the kick out of there, and I'll take it from there. So definitely going to grab a EQ right away on that bad boy. I'm going to solo it, get a nice little loop going on in on my drums. Okay. Yep, I'm hearing a lot of kick. So I'm going to go for my high-pass filter and just roll off everything until I start hearing my snare sh sound changing. Okay, so I got to about 170 before I started hearing the snare being affected. The snare isn't sizzly as I thought it would be. It's not super sizzly. I wish it sizzled a little bit more, don't you? Maybe not. That's just me being weird. It's kind of deep. I'm going to maybe try rolling off some 500. I'm going to listen to 500 first and see what it sounds like. Uh, yeah, it's really boxy, so I'm going to duck out the 500 again. And maybe find some like 4K or some upper frequencies that I like. Um, <coughs> fish around for those with a narrow Q and see if I can find some of the, the, the heart of the sizzle of the snare. Because it really exists kind of in this ballpark region here. So I'm going to boost by like 3 dB or 4 dB and a wide Q so I can encompass everything on either side of 4K. Because there's some good stuff up here. It's kind of like all around that frequency spectrum is, is the stuff that I want to hear more of. Still, I'm not really super stoked on that snare. I want it to be really sizzly. I want it like, you know, just like a harsh sizzle. So when I don't have what I want, what do I do? I did this earlier with my kick drum. I duplicate it and I get what I want. <laughs> I make it happen. You got to take it. Anyway, um, so I'm going to select my snare bottom. I'm going to right click, duplicate that bad boy. And what's a good way to get some nasty sizzle on something? Yeah. 
Well, I'll tell you. I'm going to put a distortion on the snare drum. <laughs> I'm going to just run it through a distortion plugin. So on the snare bottom, which I'm going to rename snare distortion, D-I-S-T, so I know what the heck it is, I'm going to drop a plugin from the harmonic category, the air distortion. So once I drop that on there, here's the plugin. Um, I'm going to unsolo my snare bottom and just have my one snare distortion track soloed. And I'm going to give a listen and see what this sounds like. Oh, there's my sizzle. Boom, I got distortion. I got sizzling. I got the sizzle I wanted. What, what category do you have, uh, distortion? Harmonic. harmonic. Yep, it's in the harmonic category. So you just got a yeah. Yep, just the air distortion. Um, harmonic, yeah, the first one. Okay, so it's a little crazy. You remember how, like, it's just like it, the sizzle lasts a little too long. What did we do earlier when we tightened up the, the snare sound? How did we do that? What, what tool did we use to tighten up that snare ringing? A gate. I'm going to do that same, same thing. I'm going to make some space between my distortion and my EQ, and I'm going to duplicate this gate. So if I hold down Option and click on a plugin and I drag it to another category, or another uh, insert, I can duplicate that plugin. So I, yep, holding down Option. Yep. Ooh, it just works right away, like a charm. Boom. All right, cool. So I've got my sizzle, I've got my body, I've got my regular bottom of the snare sound. So I'm going to start with the, I'm going to solo all three of these. And I'm going to tear the faders down. And I'm going to start with my snare top, which is the general generic mic on a snare would be on the top. So I can get an overall sound of what the sound, the, the drum sounds like. Hit play. Okay, so I threw it up to about 0 dB. And I'm going to bring my snare bottom. Okay. Nothing that special coming in there, but there it is. And then I'm going to add some sizzle. Not crazy, but I'm going to bring this up a little bit and listen to my sizzle improve. Okay, I've got my snare mix pretty good. I'm happy with it. I'm going to put a little, little compression on that snare, but I'm going to do it on the snare sum. So I'm going to grab that snare sum first insert and throw that BF76 compressor and solo all three of these mics, or all three of the, the snare tracks, and then set my compressor by adjusting the input to get about, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe like 5 dB of attenuation. So I'll be watching this needle pop around. And I'll watch my output on my snare sum because that's going to dictate how much volume I want to give the track or take away from the track so that I'm, you know, decent ballpark of anywhere from 10 to 5, negative 10 to negative 5 dB. I don't want to get in, to be getting too loud up there. But I want to have a pretty strong signal, not too strong. And then my attack's probably going to be pretty quick, and my release is probably going to be pre pretty quick too. So I'm just, that's what I'm thinking ahead of time, and I'm going to see what happens by playing it. So more input, input. I have compression happening now. There we go. Um, I got a pretty strong signal. I'm in the ballpark. There we go. My snare sum track's coming in between 10 and negative 5 dB. I'm going to make my attack real quick and then dial it back a little bit. And then my release.
Okay, I'm also not crazy about my snare bottom track. I think it needs a gate too. It's just a little too not tight. So I'm gonna solo those. I put a gate, I copied the gate from the previous track and I put it on that as well. So I've got gates on all my snares to kind of control that, the ring, the sustain of that snare. So I'm gonna see if that improves my, my tightness of my snare pop. Okay, sounds really weird by itself, but let's see what happens when we solo all the drums. All right, so this is a pain in the butt, guys. Check this out. I'm having to solo every single drum track. Super lame. Um, let's create a group so that we can solo all of our drums at once. You guys down for that? Let's do it. Okay, so I'm going to select from the kick front all the way through the overhead um, right mic. So all of the drum tracks as well as the drum sum. So I'm going to hold down command after I've selected all these and click on the drum sum to add that additional. So I have all of the drum, the drum tracks selected. Okay, I'm going to create a group by going to, well, it's Command G, but if you look up here somewhere, um, there's a Command G somewhere. Uh, yep, Group. So if you go under Track and, and hit Group or Command G, you create a new group. I'm going to call it the Drum Group. <clears throat> and it has all of these drum tracks that I've selected already in it. Okay, and I hit OK. And check this out. At the left bottom corner of my window, and this is my edit window, you see this group? See that there? It's Check this out. When I hit the solo button on one of my drums, look what happens. All the drums are selected at once. Watch this. All the faders move simultaneously. See what the grouping does? When you've selected the group, you can deselect it. And I can move things individually, right? But if I have the group highlighted, I can do something to every single drum track at once. Or check this out. If I click on the little circle over here, Sometimes you can hide this. Oh, here we go. Check this out. If you right click on the drum group, I can hide tracks in group. And boom, look at that. No more drums. If I'm done mixing my drums, I can just get rid of them, get them out of my way. I don't need to see them anymore. I can bring that back by right clicking on the drum and saying show tracks in group, and they're all back. Isn't that cool? Now here's the thing I don't like about it. I probably shouldn't have included my drum sum in that. So I'm gonna go ahead and do this. I'm gonna right click on my drum group. And I'm gonna go to modify. And I'm gonna go back to this window here where it says drum sum. I'm gonna select that and remove that from my group. All the tracks are listed in that right window pane here. And I took the drum sum out. And because once I get my drums set up and I'm all happy with my drum kit and how it's balanced, I'm going to basically get the drums out of my face so I don't see them. Um, I'm going to hide them all. And, well, yeah, I'm going to hide them all, hide the tracks and groups. And now I don't have to look at all those faders. I can control my drums with the volume right here, but I don't have all those drum tracks sitting there. Once I'm done processing drums and the drums are mixed and they sound great, I don't need to like get back in there and do anything until I need to. 
so I can hide that stuff and focus on the stuff that I need to mix. So you kind of see how that works? You can also do this, this little AZ button up here. That's called Command Key Focus. And I can use um, letters to engage or disengage groups. So you see how there's a letter A right there? I can activate in my group or deactivate it with the letter A. That's with the K, uh, command key focus set on this window. It's usually set on this window so that I can use R and T and stuff and edit, you know, and, and, and do keyboard shortcuts that affect this window. But anyway, that's kind of how groups work. And that's why you would group your tracks together and use this setting so that you can kind of filter and sort out tracks that you don't need to focus on or solo them all at the same time. So um, back to what we were trying to do. Uh, that was a learning moment. But uh, let's show the tracks again. And um, what I was trying to do earlier was listen to my whole drum kit. So with the group selected, I hit solo. And I want to listen to my drum kit and see what my snare drum and kick drum sound like in the whole mix. Okay, I'm going to strip away toms. Oh, shoot. Sorry. Undo that. My toms are stupid loud, and it's not important to have toms that mic'd because we have overheads. So I'm going to degroup, ungroup, unselect my group so I can individually mix, and I'm going to turn down the rack tom, floor tom, um, and then so these aren't blaringly loud. Then I'm going to listen to my drum kit again. So my snare drum sounds totally natural. I gated the heck out of it. And it sounds really weird when I solo the drum, the, the snare by itself with that gate kicking on and off. But with the overheads picking up the whole drum kit, I just added control and pop to my snare by just taking out all the extra ringing stuff that was compressed and causing the, 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 the sustain of that snare drum to kind of go longer than I expected and wanted so do you kind of see how we use those tools to control and shape that sound? We gated it, we EQ'd it, we duplicated it, brought out sonic elements of it, and then kind of tightened it up with a gate so that it's a, it's a punchier, quicker, transient sound. And then the ring and everything, all the reverberation in the room is still there because we have room mics and overheads that pick up the entire drum kit. If I solo just, if I solo just the overheads, um, there we go. I've got a group view now. So if I solo just the drum overheads, I could hear the entire the, the entire drum set with two mics. That's the whole drum kit. Everything's there. And it sounds pretty darn good. All these other individual mics are just there to boost the sounds of those individual instruments. Your overhead mics a lot of times pick up everything very well. You could just put up two overheads and maybe a kick or even just two overheads and you could get a really good drum sound with some really nice mics just over the drum kit. So anyway, you're usually setting up overheads um, you know, to capture the cymbals, but you can also use the overheads as a way of mixing your drums. Listen to the balance of the overheads, all right? Then maybe um, bring up the other instruments and balance those so that they just kind of, you know, accent the punchiness of the individual drums. Um, you might not even need tom mics. You might not even need much hi-hat. I don't know, but um, the overheads capture the whole drum kit. So anyway, to continue this, we'll, you know, obviously kind of pick this up uh, next week a little bit more. But um, we focus most of our attention on the kick and snare. And... Uh, a lot of times what I'll do, this will be the last thing, I'm gonna solo just the kick and the snare drum, and I'm gonna balance these two sounds so I have my boom chick, boots and pants kinda balance between kick and snare by using the sums. Is that the end of the song? Okay, so I'm not getting a lot of kick. So I'm going to use the BF-76. I'm going to re-engage that. 
There we go. Maybe turn the output up a little bit too. There we go. That's some healthy boomy kick. You guys hear that kick real good now? Maybe bring the snare down a touch. Okay, cool. Um, now let me turn on the rest of my drums. Really pronounced kick. Cymbals are fine. Kick and snare. Boom, chick. Boom, chick. Most important thing in a song. Boom, chick, and the voice. And then the bass fits in with the boom, chick. But you know what I'm saying? Like, you gotta have good snare, you gotta have good kick. Everything else kind of just sits in between those things, and the voice is up top. Kick, snare, voice, bass, every, everything in the center there, and everything else you're going to sprinkle around it. Okay, cool. So we'll call it for today. Um, that was uh, a lot of mixing of drums, but like those are mixing tricks to bringing out elements of sounds that you want. Think about the compartmentalized aspects of kick and snare. If you don't have something you want, duplicate it, carve it up, EQ it, compress it, throw distortion on it, whatever you got to make that sound what you want it to be. The tools are there, you just gotta know how to use them and have a purpose. Mix with purpose. You want something, go get it, make it happen. Or fly in another drum sound to make that drum sound better and just copy and paste it on top of all the other kick drums. Worst come to worst. All right, cool. All right guys, great work. Uh, have a good weekend. We'll continue mixing on Monday. Save before you quit. Always. Safety third. Yeah, safety third, you know. Safety third and uh, yeah, go fast, safe chances, fast and loose. That's how I live my life.